Hello, good morning, church. Mike, okay. Uh, we're missing a few people today. It's a, it's a very special celebration for uh, some very good friends. Uh, those of you who know me know that you know, I'd rather speak here, finish my stuff, and leave in five minutes, as I said. But fortunately, I have to uh, cut my message uh, just a little short because something important is happening at 12.30. So if you guys don't mind, I will go on until about 12.29, so I have an hour and a half. All right. If Kenneth and Bonalyn were here, they'd be strangling me by now. So anyway, uh, Sundays, we all love Sundays. Let's just open in prayer. Lord, thank you for gathering us all here safely. What a beautiful day, Lord, to worship, uh, to thank you, Lord, for all the blessings that you shower on us every day. Holy Spirit, speak through me that I may not misrepresent your word and open all of our hearts, our minds, Lord, to receive your word and to be instructed and edified by you. Thank you, Lord, in the name of your most holy son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Sundays can surprise you. Um, so, okay, when I say next, that's when. See, very efficient clicker, Gabe, Gabe. Um, I have my código here. Okay, let's, let's all be honest. How many of you hate Sundays? Growing up, growing up, I'm sure many of you, like us, were probably asked, sometimes forced by your parents, right? Wake up early, go to Mass. Many of us grew up in situations where Sunday was either boring because you didn't get to do anything. You know, it was supposed to be family day, but your family never hung out together. Uh, or a rat race. Some families are so hyped that they want, uh, they, they don't spare their children from working or studying extra during Sundays. Others grew up in homes where, you know, everything was rushed. It's already 8 o'clock. We have, everyone has to dress up. Unahan sa banyo, right? Uh, first to eat breakfast and then climb into the car so that you wouldn't be late for church. So, well, you all know what TGIF is, right? TGIF is, thank God it's Friday. ODIM is, oh darn, it's Monday. <laughs> was it, was a Sunday for you, was it, oh no, it's Sunday? Or was it, oh great, it's Sunday? I have another acronym for ODIM, but I won't mention that. It's in Tagalog. It's a little too colorful for a Sunday message. Now here's, here's why I personally, let me tell you my own story. Here's why I love Sundays. How many of you, aside from Pastor Ron and Alice, went to UP? University of the Philippines, Diliman, Quezon City. How many of you recognize this? Next, sorry. <laughs> How many of you recognize this structure? Have you ever seen that? This is, I'm very fond of this structure because not only did I go to church here growing up as a kid, I also lived quite close by. I, I lived in UP, in the, on the UP campus, UP Diliman. So I have very fond memories of my Sundays. And to this day, I have to confess, this is my favorite church building, church structure. I have been to a lot of churches already, all around the world even, even in Europe. But to me, personally, this is my favorite because of the structure. It's got this thin egg-shaped dome, right? dome shell. Uh, it is the, the cha it used to be called the Chapel of the Holy Sacrifice in UP. It's, it was the UP campus, UP Diliman campus chapel. Now I understand it's no longer a chapel. It's called the Church of the Holy Sacrifice. And it belongs, technically speaking, to the Archdiocese of Cubao, Cubao, Quezon City. So what I still regard as a chapel is now a church, and I am sure if I see it today, I might not recognize because according to my godson Raf here, the landscape is totally different. 
It's no longer the same. This is how I remember the chapel that I used to go to when I was a kid. Next one, please, Gabe. Here is the inside. That's the altar, the cross. Notice it's all open. It's quite bright and airy. It's all open uh, in the uh, ridge of the ceiling as well as the actual entrance. All around, all around it's open space. And right in the center of this circle is the altar. Uh, next slide. Here is a closer view of the altar. Closer view of the cross. Next slide. Here is the walkway. Now, this was not there when I used to go there as a kid. It was all mostly gravel. Now, it's all paved, and they have a name for this. I think they call it the river of life. And next slide, please. Now, let me tell you, can you read this? Uh, this chapel was built in 1955. I'm going to date myself. That was the year after I was born. At the instance of UP Chaplain, and I know this name very well because he was the pastor of my parents. Father John Delaney was a Jesuit. Was a Jesuit. He was the one under whose, I guess, whose uh, pastorship this uh, chapel was built. But look at these names. The youth will probably not recognize these names. But for those of us who grew up in the Philippines, my generation, these names are very, very reputable household, I'm sorry, artistic. These names belong to the National Hall of Fame, as it were, in the Philippines. Architectural design by Leandro Loxin, murals of the Stations of the Cross by Vicente Manansala, assisted by Ang Kyuko. Guys, these are all national artists of the Philippines, right? A uh, sculpture of crucifix and altar by Napoleon Abueva, national sculptor of the Philippines. River of Life floor terrazzo by Arturo Luz Construction, David Consuni, and so on and so forth. This chapel, or this church, I should say, was declared a national cultural treasure by the National Museum of the Philippines. It was also declared a national historical landmark by the National Historical Institute. So these names are hallowed names in Philippine art and sculpture and architecture. It's like saying Leonardo da Vinci built this church assisted by Pablo Picasso. That's kind of what it hits me right here. But I never knew this stuff. I didn't know who designed this church. I didn't know who built it. I just loved going there on Sundays. Why? Because my family was quite close. We lived right there in UP. We lived in UP campus. We'd wake up every Sunday. My mom would round us all up. Even my aunties, my titas, my titos. We would all go to church, all right, here. And what did I do? Well, this is my favorite building, but what did I do on Sundays? Okay, I have to confess, I just looked around and looked at all the girls, all the pretty girls. And every Sunday, I would pick out who I thought was the prettiest girl. And they were all, or almost all of them, were my neighbors. So I, I knew most of them. Some of them I didn't know, but you know, we all belong to a tight little community in UP. Next slide, please. Here's the Carillon. It's not part of the chapel, but it was a landmark uh, in the UP campus. And every Sunday, I would wake up to the toll of the bells of the Carillon. I loved Sunday so much, next slide please, that it carried over into every day. Here's the church of the, or chapel of the Holy Guardian Angels in my grade school in Quezon City. So every day, my favorite religion teacher, Mr. Javier, we would greet us there, we would go there, we would sing songs of praise. This is the interior of the chapel. Next slide, please. Uh, a little different, right? The crow or the altar is right there uh, up front, different from the chapel of the holy sacrifice where everything is around. Anyway, so much for that commercial. Next slide, please. Sunday, as our title of the message suggests, it was meant to be the best day of the week. God made Sundays for us. According to Mark 2.27, the Sabbath, was made for man, not the other way around. Not man for the Sabbath. God made Sundays for us. 
Sunday is God's solution for the hectic pace of life. Too much to do, too much pressure, too much stress, too much work during the week. No time for the things that matter. No time for family and loved ones. No time for rest. It reminds me of the story of Mary and Martha where, you know, you know the story. Jesus Christ went there. I think Pastor Rene mentioned it. Mary, or was it Martha? Martha was so busy fixing things to welcome Jesus while Mary just laid at his feet. And she knew what was important. This is kind of like what a Sunday is. Next slide, please. Okay, let's clarify. Pastor Rene, our mentor evangelist, was here last Sunday. You who were here heard him. And then we had a discipleship or, uh, I'm sorry, evangelism session with our D group and with various members the following day. Um, next slide, please. Um, here's what we learned from the gospel. And this, Pastor Rene keeps emphasizing, right? He had his five finger exercise. Grace, heaven is a free gift. You cannot earn it, you cannot deserve it, and so on and so forth. To cut the story short, what is the key to earning, not earning, but attaining salvation? According to God's gospel, according to the gospel, to the word of God, right? You trust in the Lord Jesus Christ alone as your Lord and Savior. That is when you know you are saved. That is the instance of salvation. About a month ago, um, my brother G, is G here? G and Beth? Anyway, we went to, uh, you know, we have a ministry uh, almost every month. The last Sunday of the month, we, we visit the patients at BLTC, Burlingame Long-Term Care Center, right here on Truesdale. And that particular Sunday, I asked, our brother G, to, to deliver the message, short, short message. And he went through the gospel. He went through the gospel for all the patients and the staff and the nurses and all that. And at the end of his, it took him about 45 minutes. And at the end of the gospel, there's this guy raising his hand in, in the back, at the back of the, of the room. And he said, question, do you have, is it, is it not true that you have to belong to the body of Christ in order to be saved, okay? And that got me thinking, that got me thinking. G had just spent 45 minutes, the past 45 minutes, explaining to them what saving faith is, what is the key to eternal life. And here is this question, do you not have to belong to the body of Christ in order to be saved? Now let's look at this. Trust in Jesus alone as your Lord and Savior. This is a little digression. I'm digressing, but I have to address this. If something were to happen to you today, as Pastor Rene likes to, to ask, the two diagnostic questions. Something were to happen to you today, and then you come face to face with God. And God says, okay, Mike, Berna, Joseph, why should I let you into my heaven? Now, what would you say? What would you say? Is God going to ask, how many times did you go to Mass in your life? Is He going to ask you, did you go to Mass every Sunday? Is He going to ask you, how many discipleship groups or Bible studies have you attended? Is God going to ask you that and make it the basis for accepting you into His kingdom? The short answer is no. Why? Because God already knows. God already knows. He's not keeping score and saying, ah, I don't, he didn't attend church this Sunday. He didn't attend church like, you know, several months of the year. He never attended Bible study. I'm not going to let you into my kingdom. It doesn't sound right. Okay, next slide, please. The church is God's design. Again, just a little digression. When you hear the word church, do you picture a little white building, that dome maybe, full of smiling people in their best attire? As lovely as that image is, uh, God's design for church is not related to that. Let's just get this straight. 
I don't know if Pastor Jim Welchel told you about this or maybe spoke about it. Uh, I wasn't here when he was talking about the church. But God created the church to be a unified fellowship of believers who encourage each other and carry out his ministry to the world. All right, next slide, please. Uh, many pastors like to throw Hebrew words, right, in their messages. So let, I'm going to try this. The term ecclesia with a C is a Latin term meaning the Christian church as a whole. And it comes from the Greek word ecclesia with a K, right, which means an assembly, a congregation, a council, a group of people who are called out of the world system by God's grace for the purpose of assembling to worship and serve. Where here does it say that the church is a building? Does it say anywhere there? Does the Bible actually tell you that you have to attend church every Sunday? Is that, is that in the Bible? Probably is not, not directly anyway. Ephesians 5, 22 to 30 specifies that believers are the body and Jesus is the head of such a fellowship. Under his leadership, we can enjoy the unity and purpose that he intended. Where there does it say that Jesus Christ asked you to attend a church building? Does it say that at all? Next slide, please. God's design for the gathering involves worship, instruction, encouragement, evangelism, and ministry to those in need, both within and outside its walls. It's easy for us to find church buildings. We have to be a little more discerning in finding the church that we want to belong to. If you look at our vision, what does it say? See a movement of millions of committed followers of our Lord Jesus Christ, meeting in small groups, transforming lives, families, communities, and nations for the glory of God. Where does it say meeting in a church building. Does it say that? Do we have to go to a church building to practice our faith? Next slide, please. The Bible defines the following as ministries of the church. Worshiping the living God, instructing and edifying believers, making disciples of all nations, the Great Commission, and serving the needy. Very important. It is not going to church itself that defines us as Christ followers. Rather, it is engaging in these ministries of the church that makes us Christ followers. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations is God's command. But in living out and following God's command, it helps us immensely to be part of the fellowship of believers, to be part of his church. So to me, I would say going to church is an expression of our faith and our love for Jesus Christ and following him. So now that's a little digression. I just had to spend some time doing that. Let's go next slide, please. Let's go. We're going to be reading Psalm 122, which is King David's response to an invitation to attend church. So let's go way back to the Old Testament. King David uh, is known as the, the greatest king of Israel in the Old Testament. And going to church is not something new, or it's not even something that started only after Jesus Christ resurrected. It went all the way back to the Old Testament. Psalm 122 verse 1 says, I rejoiced can we all read this, please, together? It says, I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. See, David was excited. He was excited that he got invited to the church. Those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Why is he so excited? What, what does David know? Or what, did, what, what does he know that we don't know? It's very... Uh, far from our concept of being rushed to wake up and rush to the bathroom and rush to eat breakfast and go to the church. Next slide, please. 
Verses 2 to 3, let's all read this again, please. Our feet are standing in your gates, Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built like a city that is closely compacted together. So David is describing the physical, the physical environment, the physical situation. Inside the city of Jerusalem, it's densely packed. It's closely compacted together. A lot of people packed in that small space. A crowd is gathering. Next slide, uh, Gabe. Verse 4, let's all please read this. That is where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, to praise the name of the Lord according to the statute given to Israel. So what is David saying? Lots of people, tribes, tribes of people, they're going up to worship God. They're going to glorify God because, why? Because God told them that he would like them to come and to do so according to the statute given to Israel. Next slide, please. Verse 5, let's read this. There stand the thrones for judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Right, so again, David is describing the physical environment. There is a lot of big furniture there, it seems. Next slide, please. Verse 6, let's all recite this. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure. So David is done describing the physical environment. Now he turns to what his thoughts are. What is David thinking about? He wants peace for the people that he worships with, for all the people attending the church, because he cares for them. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure. Next slide. Verses 7 to 8. Let's read this. May there be peace within your walls and security within your citadels. For the sake of my family and friends, I will say, peace be within you. So David goes deeper. He goes into the purpose of assembling together. God, David, David is saying, basically, I want you to keep my people safe and bring them peace whenever we get together. And even when we are not together, I want this for my family and for my friends. Peace be within you, wherever you are, not just in this particular location. Next slide, please. And the last verse of Psalm 122, verse 9, let's read. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your prosperity. All right, so what is David saying? God, I want this for you and for your sake too. I will do something to make this happen. I will seek your prosperity. I will do something to make this happen. I'm going to seek your prosperity because I love your place, I love your people, and I love you. That is what David basically is saying. Next slide. So what are the six great reasons to go to church that we just read in Psalm 122? Number one, David liked being with God's people. He said, that's where my tribes go. Next slide. He wanted to honor God. I want to go to church to praise the name of the Lord. Next slide. He wanted to do what God asked him to do, right? The statutes of Israel. I want to go to church because the statutes given to Israel told us to do that. God is asking them. He has asked them to do that. Next slide. David wanted peace for those who love God. He just wants good things for God's people. Everyone wants peace for those they love. You don't want to intend any malice on people that are close to you. So it's very natural. God, this is my family. This is my people. This is your family and your people. God bless all of us with your peace. Next slide. David wanted peace because God's people, again, were his family and his friends. Next slide. He committed himself to the prosperity of the house of God. And he says so quite explicitly. I will do something. I want nothing but prosperity 
for the house of God. And he is doing this when he is attending or, uh, or worshiping God with fellow believers in a certain location in the church. Next slide, please. Um, why should Sunday be the best day of the week for you? We're going to go a little back. Uh, because I'm a little older, I kind of remember what Sundays were. And I'm sure that many of you, if you watch movies, you watch TV shows, you will see glimpses of what Sunday was like. Not just in the Philippines, where a lot of us are from, but in this country, our adopted country. Let's talk about the U.S. now, because we're all here. And this is where we are worshiping, right? Once upon a time in this country, we're talking about our adopted country, the U.S., everything stopped on Sundays. People went to church, worshiped God, they ate together, they fellowshiped together, they hung out together, they rested and recreated together in the afternoon. Sunday was not considered an extra work day. On the other hand, well, it was not even a bonus day to put our kids in so-called high-impact activities, extra violin practice, extra math kumon practice, extra study day. No. Kids, this is a day of rest. The whole family, this is a day of rest. Sunday was a, desk, a day of rest and worship. I want to tell you why I want Sunday to be the best day for each and every one of you. And I want everyone to experience great Sundays every week. Then let's talk a little bit about that. Next slide. Does anyone remember? Oh, sorry. Did I skip a slide? Okay, so I uh, had a greater sense of peace. I'm sorry. I, did, is that the next slide, uh, Gabe? Do we have? Okay. Okay, does anyone remember this? Do you know who this, these are? Okay, I, I see the older people. <laughs> these young kids are like staring. <laughs> What's happening? Jeremy, do you know who these are? See? The old... <laughs> if I show you the picture of the Beatles, would you know who they are? Oh, yeah. But they wouldn't know who the... You know who this is? Uh, back in the... When was this? 60s, maybe? 60s? Uh, there was this TV show, series called The Waltons, right? The Waltons. Uh, how many were they? Mama and Papa, they were there. They're not uncle and aunt. They, no, I think those were the grandparents. And they had like something like seven kids. Uh oh. Uh oh, now I owe my wife something. <laughs> Was it the second time? I owe my wife something. Okay, now what we're talking about here are family values. Those of you who saw the Waltons or watched some of the episodes at least, I don't know if they're still being replayed in some cable channel. But once you see even just one show, or maybe not even the full show, you will know immediately what this is all about. This is about so-called traditional, old, let's call it old school, old school values, family values, family values. And note there might be seven children, grand, grand, Lolo and Lola, Papa and Mama, and not to be missed, there's a dog, all right? Every good family has to have a dog. Yeah. That's not in God's word, but I'm sure <laughs> Brother Sam and Monsignor Luis will not disagree with me. Next slide, please. I hope the, uh oh. Let me just catch up here. Now I'm losing my, okay, I hope, I hope we have all the slides here anyway. I don't think this is working anymore. So I'm gonna go by what is projected. 
Let's just hope that this works. No, it's not responding. The arrow is there, but it's not responding. Anyway, uh, Gabe, I'm going to rely on you. I don't have my Codigo clicker. No, but I can't control it from my... Well, let's see if it, if it works. Uh, where are we? Okay. Thank you. Okay, here they are again. You see how big this ra that's a radio. Do you know do you know what it takes now to listen to music? Who has a USB? A small, small, tiny USB. That's that's all you need now to listen to music. This is this is the the ancestor of the USB, let's put it that way. Oops. Did I press the right button? Okay, there you go. See, that's the, that's the image you get when, when this, this uh, series starts to show. And I will say to you that there is a great correlation, right? If you plot happiness and prosperity, some intangible on the vertical axis, and the horizontal is time, there is a good correlation between happiness and prosperity in this country and church attendance. And that's not so surprising. Why would Sunday be the best day of the week for you? There's something intangible. You cannot see it or touch it or taste it or smell about church attendance that makes it the most powerful investment of your week. Something about being in church makes us better and qualifies us for special blessings and provisions from it. Once upon a time, Sunday was the best day of the week for almost everybody. And I'm sure many of you can relate to this. And life was better for almost everybody. And I want that again for our country, and I want that again for you. What's the importance of the Sabbath? At the beginning of time, God created the heavens. You all know this. He created the heavens and the earth, and after it was all done, made the sun and the moon. Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 to 3 says, By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that God has, had done. Even God had to rest, right? After all the work that God did to create the world. God rested on the seventh day. Did God get tired? Does God get tired? Why did God rest on the seventh day? Because he knew that we would need to rest every seventh day. So God was setting the example for the way he wanted us to live. He wanted us to see how important that was, meaning to rest every seventh day. And so he set the example for us. So God is saying, okay, I've done my work. I'm going to rest now. Not because I need it, but because I want you, my children, to rest after you do your work during the week. That is basically what God is saying and what he has done. Why is the Sabbath important too? Because it's a commandment. It's part of God's Ten Commandments, right? In fact, it was the fourth commandment. What are God's exact words in Exodus 20, 8 to 11? Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son, your daughter, nor your male or female servant. Our maids in the Philippines got Sunday off, maybe. Yes. Maybe rotation, right? Somebody would stay, okay, mag off day ka muna, right? Rest day, nor your male or female, nor your animals. Well, Sam's dog is Sunday every day nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. 
Now, what are the reasons to invest? Invest, what do I mean by invest? You spend your time, right? Investing means not money, it's not money. You spend your time, you spend your resource. You make time, you make time, not just you, but your family, right? Why should we invest in a weekly Sabbath? Because we need it, I need it. It's like saying, would you go through 24 hours without sleep? Maybe you can, but at the end of that, you'd feel a little worn down. Our daily cycle of life is, okay, we work during the day, fellowship maybe in the evening, but we need, we need our six or so hours of sleep, right? Or some people maybe less, some people maybe more. But you need to do that to recharge every single day. That's kind of like what Sunday is for us. Why? Because God asks me to. Very clearly, it's the fourth command, right? Thou shalt keep the Sabbath holy, right? We don't need that to be saved, as I said, but that is how we exercise our faith, how we profess our belief in God, and how we obey the Lord's commands. God blessed the Sabbath, as we have seen in the, uh, in the readings. He blessed the Sabbath. My life goes better when I Sabbath, when I go to church every Sunday. I don't know how you feel when you skip church on some Sundays. It's inevitable that circumstances, we may have to miss church on certain Sundays, but I kind of feel incomplete if I miss church. Nope, did I skip? Okay. Many think we can get ahead faster if we are productive seven days a week. You, how many know or have eaten in a Chick-fil-A? Chick-fil-A. Do you know the background of Chick-fil-A? No, it's no Sunday. Why? Do you know who the owner of Chick-fil-A is? He's a devout Christian. He's gotten in trouble with customers already because of his faith. He's been boycotted by certain groups. But the policy in Chick-fil-A is every Chick-fil-A store is closed on Sundays. Do you know that Chick-fil-A, I bet you didn't know this, is the most prosperous fast food restaurant in the whole world. No one makes as much money per location. It is closed on Sundays to honor the Sabbath, to allow their employees, actually, to honor the Sabbath. Now what's happening in this country? It used to be Black Friday, right? Black Friday. After Thanksgiving, what, 4 a.m., 5 a.m. on the following day? Haba ng pila, right? They're all lining up to get like, you know, $50 large screen TVs. You know, they're stampeding and pushing each other. Nakapila na. Now, even Thursdays, the stores are open, right? Some stores are open on Christmas Day. Stores are open on Easter Sunday, Baliwalaya. Easter Sunday, yeah, they're all, they're all open. Come. There's a sale going on, right? What does Chick-fil-A do? It's closed, not just Christmas Day or New Year's Day or Easter Sunday. It's closed every Sunday, right? 52 weeks a year they're closed. And yet, they make more money in six days a week than McDonald's, Subway, Burger King, and Taco Bell do in seven. They are the most prosperous fast food restaurant chain in the world on a per location basis. My life goes better when I Sabbath. Sociologists have studied the benefits and we have the references uh, uh, in our file, what they found is that those who attend church reg regularly live seven and a half years longer than those who don't. 56% more likely to have an optimistic outlook on life than those who don't. 27% less likely to be depressed. 35% less likely to get divorced. Do you know what the statistics are <coughs> on marriages in America today? Guess how many or what percentage of marriages end up in separation and divorce? Does anyone care to guess? Do you know what it is? Currently, today, it's more than 
more than 50 percent. And I'm very sorry to say and sad to say that even Christians, same statistic applies. More than 50 percent of Christian marriages end up in divorce and separation. Higher average levels of commitment to partners, higher levels of marital satisfaction, less thinking and talking about divorce, the D word, the D word, and lower levels of negative inter. Higher grades, youth, listen to this. Practice better time management. Youth, don't listen to this. Better sex life. Close, close. One ear close. Guys, sex is only within the context of marriage, okay? Not, not outside marriage. When you get married and you are a God-fearing, Christ-following Christian, you will have a better sex life if you practice your faith. The studies are clear. Life goes better for those who go to church regularly. I'm not surprised. Reasons to invest. My Mondays go better when I Sabbath. Why? Because you... You've rested, you've refueled, you have recharged, and you're ready for another week of work. We'll talk a little bit more about that. My family does better when I Sabbath. What does church teach you? What does interacting with fellow believers teach you? What does God's Word teach you? We're taught to have better relationships, create better relationships, nurture better relationships with fellow men, with family. My eternity will go better when I Sabbath. Again, going to church is not the key to salvation, but it is a fruit of your saving faith. And I express or I practice and I profess my saving faith by obeying Jesus Christ. It's the result of trusting in Jesus Christ alone, because then I want to follow his command. And I want to follow the Great Commission. Can I share my faith? Can I go to the ends of the, of the world to disciple other people and show them how to obey Christ? I cannot do that myself. I have to be part of a larger body, much bigger than myself, to be able to do that. And that is the ministry that we enjoy within Christ's body. It's not about a building at all. It's about being part of God's people on earth. God loves Sundays and he wants you to love them too. Psalm 100 verse 4. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. How do we make Sunday the best day of our week? Number one, decide to let Sunday be the best day of your week. It's an act of the will, right? It's like love. Some people say, you know, love is that tingling emotion and feeling that I want to be with this person I love. Well, you know, three, four, five, ten years into your marriage, you don't have that tingling feeling anymore. Did you fall out of love? No, love is an act of the will that you decide to do every single day. It's not an emotion. It's an act of the will, right? I will that Sunday will be the best day of the week for me. Invest in your Sundays. Devote your time. Encourage your family, even if your children are not inclined to do so. Take your next step, whatever that is. Let's talk a little bit about that. Is that really? Okay. Here you go. Survey of satisfied church members. Number one, I have some important stuff to say about this, but church members, are you guys happy to be here at CCF? Amen. Are you guys happy to be here? Yes. Here's a survey of satisfied church. They attend regularly. I hope to see you here every Sunday. On time, 10.30, not 10.45, not 10.50, 10.30. They have a place they serve within the church. Within this church, do you have a ministry? Do you belong to a D group? If you don't, you're missing out on something really big. Serve within the church. 
They develop at least six friendships with other members. How many here have been coming here and yet do not have any friends? It's almost impossible. You have six friendships. I'm pretty sure, except maybe for the newcomers, right? You will have at least six people here that you can call your friends or brothers or sisters. They call the church, my, this is my church. This is our church. I have seen people here when my wife and I joined nine years ago, ten years ago. I've seen people come and go. Uh, let's be honest. You see people come and go for various reasons. Many of our youth went on to college. Some of them have come back, you know, as the opportunity uh, arose. But they go on to college, they pursue their careers, they go. Some people move out of state, some people have gone back to the Philippines, some people have relocated, job reasons for whatever reason, they go. Some people are just not happy, they're looking for something, they're looking for something that they don't find in this church. We've seen a lot of those, okay? I'll address that a little bit later. They give consistently to the church. Tithing is not a requirement. All right? Although it is in God's word, give a tenth right, of what you have to the church. But that is purely voluntary. There is no compulsion, coercion. It's you give out of your own heart. And we respect that. They invite others to the church. You know, it's part of our evangelism ministry, right? Part of the mission of Christians is you share your faith. And a natural consequence of that is, look, I find joy and rest in this church. I want my friends to experience the same thing. I'm going to invite them. And that's how many of us continue to attend this church. Now, let me talk a little bit about this thing about my church, right? You see, the church is composed of imperfect people, right? And therefore, no church can be perfect. When Jesus Christ discipled his 12 apostles, prepared them, right? Prepared them to plant the roots of his kingdom on earth. It did not happen overnight. All of these apostles were sinful and broken people, right? 12 ordinary men. They were all sinful and broken. And when Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead, he did not tell them right away, okay, let's go plant, let's go plant all these churches. No. He said, wait. Why? They were not prepared. They had lived, maybe ate, slept, lived with Jesus Christ for three years, maybe. But they were not prepared. What did Jesus Christ say? Wait, I will send you a helper. Right? He will send the Holy Spirit to equip and empower these 12 ordinary men to establish his kingdom on earth. Now, if the church is composed of people and people are imperfect, will you ever find a perfect church? There are many people in this church whom I know who have gripes about, well, you know, whatever they complain about, you don't, don't like the pastor's message, they don't like the layout of this building, we're bursting at the seams, it's too small. They don't like maybe the songs that the praise team is singing. They don't like the way Brother Sam is playing his keyboard. <laughs> they don't like, biro lang, biro lang. They don't like, whatever. They're, we don't have food every Sunday. We used to have like uh, lunch every third, last Sunday of the month, we would have a nice spread, catered, right? Good food. They don't like, what? Sometimes the coffee is late, right? <laughs> they don't like, whatever reason, selfishness, pride, arrogance, chismis, there may gossip ba dito? Meron mahilig? May mahilig ba mag chismis dito? Guys, we're, we're all sinful people. There is not one person here. Right? Is it any wonder that the church is not perfect? As the great English preacher David Pawson said, listen to this, what did David Pawson say about the church? 
If you see a perfect church, don't join it. You're going to ruin it. <laughs> now, let me repeat that. If you see a perfect church, please, please don't join it because you will ruin it. Okay? Uh, nobody has seen a perfect church. Nobody. Right? And that's why Jesus Christ leaves us always with the Holy Spirit to guide us. Try as we might. It's the same thing. I hope, you know, I have accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior. Do I still continue to sin? Yes, I do. I do. I hope it's less and less, but I do. Right? Living the Christian life is impossible for us. But with God, everything is possible. Now look, Jesus Christ himself said, uh, what is it? John 13, 34 to 35. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you must love one another. And by this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Now, how can you love one another if there is no one another? Can you love yourself, just yourself? You exist all by yourself. You are all of humanity. Can you love? God made us to be in relationships with one another, right? Even God, if you go to our basic truth, the basic dogma of Christianity, even God is in a relationship with himself. The triune God, three persons in one God. God the Father, the Supreme Being. God the Son in whom all things were made, all of creation. God the Holy Spirit, God indwelling in us. God loves His Son, the Son obeys the Father, and He leaves Himself in the Holy Spirit to be with us. Three persons in one God. God has a relationship with Himself. How much more we? We exist to be in relationship with one another, and this is the strongest argument I have for going to church. Because never will you be in fellowship with other believers as iron sharpens iron. That is how we, men and women of the church, can benefit each other. We instruct, edify each other in the faith. We learn more about God, more about God's word. You cannot do that in a vacuum. You cannot disciple and show others how you want to live to become like Christ if there is no others. You cannot love one another if there is no one another. We are meant to be in a fellowship, in relation with each other, right? And that is the strongest argument for going to church. And finally, why should Sundays be the best day of the week for you? Especially in June. Sundays in June, why is, it, why is it the best day of the week? Next one, please. Oh, I'm sorry. I have the clicker. Sorry. You know why? Especially in June, the whole country watches. Especially because it's warriors. Warriors. Right? Warriors Sunday, 5 p.m. today. The second game of the finals. And hopefully every June we will be watching the Warriors in the finals. Right? Warriors Sunday. Warriors Sunday. Um, and I'd like to add, uh, Kenneth and Bonalyn might <laughs> start strangling me, but I have another thought. Why, is sun why should Sunday be the best day? We have all these arguments for... Recharging, refueling, rejuvenating, refreshing. Um, three Thursdays ago, my wife and I went <coughs> out of state to be with some friends. Uh, there's a sweet, innocent little girl that my wife and I treat almost like a daughter since we met her. Uh, make a long story so short, she Early morning on a Friday, she communicated with us, said, please come and get me, and text messaging, and 
she was sexually assaulted. Um, came to get her. Uh, and seeing the consequence of evil, it just broke my heart. It just broke my heart. And my heart still bleeds. Two days after that incident happened, uh, we went to church. It, this was out of town, so my wife and I found a Christian church close by. And this, this little girl is, she goes to Catholic church in the Philippines. She decided to come with my wife and I that Sunday to attend the worship service at the Christian church. And I asked her, have you ever been to a Christian worship service? And she said, yes. So I asked her, where, where did you go? She said she attended the worship service in this church in Manila beside Tiendecitas. And I said, was it CCF? And she said, yes. And I asked her, what, what did you like about this? Why did you go to this church? And she said, because the worship service was very meaningful for her. And that the Bible study she attended was very intimate for her. And so I'd like to propose that Sundays will be a critical part of the recovery and healing of this innocent little girl. And I pray that the Lord will continue to protect her and grant her the healing because I know that she's on the right path. And I believe that nothing happens without a reason. I believe that God makes everything good for those who love Him and who are called to His purpose. And I am confident that Sundays will be a trigger for healing and recovery for this little girl. Let's all pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word for creating all of us and for all the days of the week that you have made. May we all, Lord, we hope to see each other here every Sunday and make Sundays, Lord, the best day of our lives to refuel us, to recharge us, and to heal us, Lord, from all of our sins, to make us, Lord, true followers of your Son, Jesus Christ, in obedience to your commands that we make the Sabbath holy, Lord, that we go out, proclaim your word, and make disciples of all nations, for you will be with us to the ends of the earth. In the name of Jesus Christ, we all pray. Can we all stand for a closing song?